over to murli sir Uh, we welcome you all for this uh, virtual CME pro program from the Department of Cardiology, Sri Ramachandra Institute of Cardiology. Uh, uh, the, today we will be discussing about cardiac imaging. Uh, one from uh, the uh, from Dr. Uh, Krishna Murthy sir, who is very well known in uh, cardiac coronary CT imaging and its interpretation, along with Dr. Jabra sir, who is an expert in uh, cardiac MRI. So I would like to ha hand over the mic to Dr. Murthy sir. Yeah. <coughs> My pleasure. In fact, a great pleasure to uh, be in this session where Dr. Kimusar is there. Kimusar is known to me for more than uh, from 1987, something like that. Uh, I was inducted into cardiology by uh, Kimusar, in fact, when I was in Stanley, I was doing my MDPG. <coughs> I fondly remember the days where I used to do duties with Sir and the heated discussion arguments we had and the cycle has come a full turn now with sun is with us Ritam, doing greatly so it's my pleasure to see you sir here to share this uh, session with you and i know the amount of uh, personal contribution you have done for ct carney angiogram you have made arguably the one of the best model investigation by your involvement in that in the last uh, 10 to 15 years and your clinical acumen is well known among all the uh, cardiology uh, I mean, uh, faculties and students in this part of the world. In fact, uh, the, your uh, extensive clinical knowledge has made this application of uh, CT uh, imaging in cardiology an uh, easy one. That's how I always felt like that. So it's, it's always a forte of a cardiologist who knows cardiac anatomy and physiology for interval CT imaging is a, is a great boon to any institute it serves. So it's my pleasure. And the other person whom I happen to see, like once I see a teacher, an imaging expert, other than Dr. Jabaraj, who was my junior but a great friend from uh, Willow days, uh, another uh, impeccable authority in MRI imaging. So today we have two diodes in this thing. Uh, emerging fields of cardiac imaging apart from cath and echo, ACT and MRI, and it's going to be a very important learning uh, session for everyone, not only the students, but all the faculties and panelists. With these few words, I would love to invite Dr. Kimusa to deliver his talk on CT followed by Dr. Jabaraj. Thank you, sir. Um, Over to you, sir. Kimo, sir. You can start as you like. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Murali. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. Uh, I'm really very happy uh, to be amongst you all uh, during this evening time. Anyhow, uh, uh, the topic is too big and uh, the indications and uh, the need for CT angiogram is so vast. I would like to confine myself only to uh, coronary artery disease. The coronary artery disease is the leading cause of morbidity and mortality throughout the world. Actually, India has now become one of the epidemic centers for ischemic heart disease and for diabetes. So far, invasive angiography was the only method to image coronary arteries directly and still is the gold standard. CT coronary angiogram has come a long way. Uh, it may not replace the invasive angiogram, but definitely it will be sort of a complementary one for invasive angiogram in the years to come by.
Now, why is that the CT, CT as it is introduced long back has not picked up so much of prominence in the evaluation and imaging of uh, the heart? And because heart is a moving organ. So to image the heart, you have to literally freeze the heart. You have to make the heart motionless to get a clear picture. So for that, you need a very high temporal resolution. The first generation of the CT scanners, the temporal resolution was so low that it is not able to get a meaningful picture of the heart. And because the coronaries are so small, you need a high spatial resolution to get a good image of the coronary arteries. And also, always there is a fear of the high radiation dose associated with CT angiogram. And also, you need to give quite a lot of contrast medium. So these are the four uh, tumbling blocks for the evolution of CT angiogram in evaluating uh, the cardiac diseases. So now, uh, the, the big attempt is made to overcome all the problems. Apart from the movement of the heart, the coronary arteries themselves have got an intrinsic movement. LAD has got the least movement. RCA has got the highest movement. But the movement is least during two phases of cardiac cycle. One is in end diastole, the other one is in end systole. To uh, visualize the coronary arteries, the diastolic phase is always preferable because that is when the coronary arteries are maximally filled. If the heart rate is very high and if you are not able to get a meaningful image in end diastolic phase, then you can always opt for end systolic phase. Now, what are the methods by which you can increase the temporal resolution? One is to bring down the heart rate to between 50 and 60 by giving beta blockers. So when you give a beta blocker and if the heart rate is around 50 to 70, you get a good quality image in diastole that is about 60 to 75 percent of the RR interval. If the heart rate is fast, if it is more than 80 or 90, then you'll have to see in end systole, which is about 35 to 45 percent of RR interval. Now, by decreasing the heart rate, you can improve the temporal resolution and by increasing the speed of gantry rotation. Usually, the gantry rotates at a speed of 330 milliseconds. But it has got a technical limitation. It can't be uh, made to rotate much, much faster. Now, with the present generation, it is about 250 milliseconds. So when the gantry rotates around the patient, you don't need to go through the entire circle to image one slice. Half circle or 180 degrees is enough to image one full circle. So the resolution becomes 330 by 2, that is 165 milliseconds. When you image, when you give two sources instead of one X ray source, if you do two X ray sources, then the resolution improves by another two fold. So it becomes about 75 milliseconds. And now uh, the, uh, the initial uh, uh, generator, initial uh, uh, CT scanners. They had a very low number of detector rows. Now, the minimum detector row that is needed is 64 slides. Now, we have got about 320 to 700 rows. So, with more number of rows, large area is covered. When large area is covered, obviously, the temporal resolution improves. Now, this is what I was telling. So, when you use a single source, the gantry rotation by two will be the temporal resolution. When you use dual source, gantry rotation by 1.4 will be the temporal resolution. Now, uh, the, with 64 slice CT, the length that is covered will be 4 centimeters. Assuming that the length of the heart is around 15 centimeters, then you'll have to take three or four cardiac cycles. So in the same corresponding period of the cardiac cycle, image is acquired for three or four cardiac cycles. They are stitched together to get the final report. If the detector row increases from 64 to 128, the coverage length increases to 8 centimeters. And with 320 rows with a single heartbeat, you can cover 16 centimeters. With a single heartbeat, you can cover the entire heart. So the temporal resolution from the days of four rows, it has increased to 7.5 milliseconds with the 320 slides. And the spatial resolution has become sub-millimeter. It is about 0.4 millimeters, though the conventional uh, invasive coronary angiogram is about 0 0.2 to 0 0.3 uh, millimeters. Still, it is not able to match the spatial resolution of our invasive angiogram, but it is good enough.
and the volume coverage or the distance that is covered by uh, four row is 0.5 to 3 centimeters and with the 320 rows it is 15 centimeters and the time the patient has to hold the breath from a phenomenal 30 to 40 seconds it is now reduced to two seconds making it so much comfort comfortable to the patient now, when we compare uh, the various non-invasive techniques to image the heart, if we see uh, the parameters, the spatial resolution and temporal resolution, cardiac CT is fairly better when compared with the other things. So the spatial resolution with cardiac CT is 0.33, with echo it is 1.2, with cath it is 0.15 to 0.25, MRI it is one millimeter. And the temporal resolution for cardiac CT with the presently available uh, uh, units are 75 milliseconds. For echo, it is 30 to 50, and it is 30 milliseconds. MRI it is 50 to 100 milliseconds. Uh, this is one way of reducing the dose, radiation dose. The, the top row, you, if you look at the gray area, that is the time when uh, the radiation is given to the patient. So the patient is given radiation throughout the cardiac cycle and the images are occurred continuously and following the acquisition, it is retrospectively, it is processed. So with this retrospective continuous rotation, uh, the uh, dosage is about 12 millisieverts. In the second row, the still it is, uh, uh, the movement is continuous. The gantry rotates continuously around the patient and the table is moved continuously. But then if you give, if you look at here, the maximum dose is given only in the diastolic phase. In other phases where you don't want to acquire the image, uh, the dose is grossly reduced. So by doing this, the, the uh, current given is about nine millisieverts. And the third one is step and shoot. In the previous two techniques, uh, the patient will be continuously moving and gantry will be continuously rotating. Here, during the acquisition phase, the table remains stationary and the image is acquired. After the acquisition is completed, the table is moved to the second uh, uh, part. Again, it is uh, immobile here. Again, uh, the image is acquired. So uh, there is uh, no radiation at all in between the acquisition phases. So here the dose is reduced to about five millisieverts. The last one is single bit. So the width of the detector row is so large that it can cover the entire heart in one cardiac cycle. And the dose obviously is reduced to around three millisieverts. So now majority of the problems that were associated with the older generation uh, CT scans are taken care of. Now the radiation is very low, temporal resolution is fairly good, though the spatial resolution is not matching with the invasive angiogram, still it is within the acceptable range. Now the journey of cardiac CT, it starts with calcium scoring, then we can move on to the symptomatic phase. Calcium scoring is done in asymptomatic patients. And for symptomatic patients, we have in chronic coronary syndrome, acute chest pain evaluation, block characterization, congenital anomalies, graft evaluation, and stent evaluation, you do an angiogram. These are the contraindications for coronary CT, obesity. When uh, the BMI is more than 30, there is a gross degradation of the quality of the image that it may not be interpretable. And if the patient for some reason is not able to cooperate, not able to hold the breath, not able to lie down comfortably, then movement is a big enemy for CT angiogram. And people who have got a contrast allergy, obviously you can't do that. And people with renal failure, obviously there's contraindication. If you have heart rate, now that we can acquire the uh, images with a single heartbeat, it becomes a relative contraindication. It is not an absolute contraindication. Heavy calcification of the arteries because of the blooming artifact the shadows extend onto the lumen. So assessing the uh, uh, stenosis is a little bit difficult. So when you see a yeah, heavy calcification of coronary arteries, it becomes a contraindication for angiogram. Now this is how the image is acquired. And uh, it is from the cranial to caudal, starting from uh, the aortic and pulmonary artery, arterial level, it goes up to the diaphragm. You can see the uh, main pulmonary uh, aorta, main pulmonary artery. Now we are seeing the right coronary artery, 
after the acquisition is completed which hardly takes about uh, uh, 50 seconds it, it needs processing the processing involves many uh, different ways of processing it one is volume rendering what you see here is the volume rendered image this is the maximal intensity projection and this is code planar reformation now this is volume rendering one big advantage of ct coronary angiogram is you can rotate the heart in whichever degree whichever side you want to you can tilt it up and down you can tilt it right and left so whichever way you want to see uh, there is no fixed angle in all the 360 degrees you can see the heart so this uh, 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 maximal intensity projection it almost looks like uh, now the coronary artery in its uh, uh, in its course so this will not look like a uh, native coronary artery uh, this is a uh, multiplanar uh, reformation the one on the left extreme is left anterior descending artery middle row is left circumflex artery and the right is right coronary artery now you are seeing in the short axis view left main coronary artery left main coronary artery and lad this is circumflex coronary artery this is right coronary artery and you see a dense calcification of the disc left main coronary artery and also a mixed clot in the mid lad now to assess the stenosis you are supposed to look at the images in two orthogonal uh, angles one is in the long axis the other one is in the short axis even with that it may be difficult at times to uh, clearly see the lumen then you have the option of giving color coding to the different tissues the green color is the lumen and yellow color is the calcification and the pink one is uh, soft clots see here you are taking a cross section of the left main coronary artery of the same patient and you see a small area of calcification here and the lumen but then what is missing here is the soft clots if you give a color coding you can see uh, the yellow spot is uh, the calcium and the pink one is the soft clot and the lumen here now here you have got a uh, soft and calcific clot a mixed clot but no luminal narrowing as opposed to the mid lad in mid lad you see uh, the lumen is very narrow here and beyond that you have got a soft clot and a small calcium speck of calcium when you take a cut section here when it is not color coded you see the calcium well but the lumen is not that well seen and also the soft clot with color coding you can see the uh, the lumen very well it, it shows a tight stenosis and also the calcification and the soft clot and a ct can also be used to assess the lv function this is more accurate than echocardiogram it is a computer generated one and uh, if from the end diastole and end systole it computes the volume and and gives you the ejection fraction and is assessed in two planes one in the long axis the other one in the short axis view calcium scoring is a computer generated uh, uh, value and it gives Uh, the arteries involved left main lad circumflex rca and the total calcium the number of lesions that are present in a coronary artery and the volume mass and finally it gives uh, the scoring okay so the 70.7 is the absolute calcium value in this patient it is also given as the percentile of uh, the general population uh, the this is about 60th percentile the calcification is about 60th percentile which is not very significant now we'll move on to calcium scoring if you look at the disc uh, uh, in an observational study 222 patients who suffered first acute myocardial infarction only 10% of the patient were in the high risk category 18% were in the moderate risk category nearly about 72% of the people were in the low risk category but means majority of the people in the low risk category where the uh, give a very low probability of developing an event is not correct 
so with the available risk scoring the it is very imprecise so you need to have some other uh, mode of exactly reclassifying the people in uh, at risk people who need a preventive measure should be treated properly people who do not require a preventive measure should not be given unnecessary medicine so you need to have some other accurate way of finding out which patients are likely to suffer from an event that is where the coronary artery calcium scoring might fill in the gap so the calcium scoring is a rapidly occurred prospectively ecg triggered non contrast ct scan of the heart it doesn't need beta blocker it doesn't need any vasodilators it doesn't need any iodine contrast and the radiation dose is approximately 1 millisievert it is almost comparable to a screening mammogram as i said already it is expressed as agastan units in absolute terms or as a percentile calcium scoring indicates coronary atherosclerosis burden we must always remember that when you see a calcification of the coronary arteries that means there is atherosclerosis only atherosclerosis calcification can be seen as calcification of the coronary artery the calcium score gives an idea about the atherosclerotic burden and generally it, it shows nearly about only 20% of the total atherosclerotic burden the rest of the things are below the sea level what we see is only the tip of the iceberg and also we should remember that calcification does not tell us about the presence or absence of stenosis so this calcium scoring is used to find out statin eligible candidates or people who are eligible for primary prevention in the intermediate risk group of framingham score if the framingham framingham score is 7.5 to 19.9 uh, these are the group of patients we are not very sure whether we should give statin or no statin so they are maximally benefited by risk stratification also the intermediate group or the borderline group uh, 5 to 7.5 with a family history of premature, premature atherosclerosis so these are the two group of patients where calcium scoring will be of great help in reclassifying it is not indicated in symptomatic patients it is not indicated in very low risk that is 0 to 5 because those patients are very unlikely to benefit from uh, uh, calcium scoring or statins and very high risk group patients where the event rate is more than 20 they will definitely need statins and also as a follow up of statin efficiency there is no need to repeat the calcium scoring maybe there is a case for a repeat study of the calcium scoring in people where initially they fall under the low risk group and after 5 years if they move on to the next category maybe we will have to reclassify the patients we can repeat the calcium scoring otherwise there is no place for repeating the calcium scoring to find out the statin efficiency now on the left side of the diaphragm there is no calcium and you see a dense calcification on the right side of the film the, 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 this is the uh, left main coronary artery and this is lad diagonal and circumflex coronary artery so the the single largest study Uh, which has tried to integrate uh, the calcium scoring with the traditional risk factors is uh, MISA, multi ethnic study of atherosclerosis. Look at here in the uh, uh, left extreme, there is no risk factor and the event rate is 0.6. And here, when there are three risk factors involved, the risk increases by about fivefold to 3.5. Whereas when the calcium score from 0 it becomes to less than it becomes 1 and 100 look at what happens here almost the event rate is equal to that of having three risk factors so the calcium scoring is a much more powerful predictor of events a patient with no risk factor as the calcium score increases from 0.6 they move on to almost about 14 to 15 times and if they have more than three risk factors or three risk factors and your calcium score of more than 300 then the event rate is about 34% sorry Okay. 
sorry for the so uh, when the calcium scoring is zero it does not mean that he is free from events calcium scoring does not rule out the presence of soft clot so, but the risk equivalent is very low 10 year event rate is 1.4 when if the calcium score keeps on increasing 1 to 100 is low 101 to 400 is intermediate more than 400 is high and more than 1000 is very high when the calcium score is zero you see in the uh, right sided picture when the calcium score is zero if you treat the patient with statin the benefit is nil but when the calcium scoring is more than 400 if you institute statin therapy and uh, look at uh, the benefit they get nearly about five times this is non statin this is statin and the calcium scoring is 401 so what we call it is power of zero when the calcium score is zero this patient does not require statin despite the presence of one or two risk factors but if the patient's calcium score is 100 and more even though there is no traditional risk factor these people will benefit highly with statin therapy so generally the calcium scoring is used for negative predictive value generally it is meant for de risking the patient when the patient has got two risk factors unnecessarily the patient may be given statin for a lifelong commitment if the calcium scoring is zero in this group of patients you can be rest assured that they don't benefit with uh, uh, with statins and statins are not indicated so the 2018 guidelines for individuals between 40 to 75 years without clinical ascvd calculate the 10 year risk using uh, the uh, framingham risk score if uh, the this is the step 1 if the score is less than 10 and if there is a family history of premature ascvd then you can give uh, calcium scoring otherwise there is no need for calcium scoring in this group of patients if the score is more than 20% they are obvious candidates for uh, uh, startings they also don't require calcium scoring it is in the intermediate group of patients you do the calcium scoring the calcium scoring is zero just the uh, healthy heart lifestyle management and and no statins and if the calcium scoring is more than 100 you give statins and also aspirin because in this group of patients benefit of aspirin outweighs the risk involved so it is in the intermediate group when the calcium score is 1 to 99 lifestyle management and you can consider pharmacological lipid treatment now we will move on to the next uh, ct coronary angiogram in chronic syndrome so in people who have got chronic chest pain syndrome it is always recommended that you do some testing and find out the probability of the patient having an ischemic heart disease or no so far it is a functional testing exercise treadmill or a, a nuclear medicine or stress echocardiogram they were ruling but now you have got another option also to test these people that is anatomical testing by ct angiography now the in 2015 there was a big debate of which test the patient should undergo functional testing or anatomical testing the advantage of anatomical testing is you look at the three group of patients given in this picture on the left extreme you have people who have got normal coronary arteries and the, in the middle panel you have uh, coronary arteries with non obstructive disease and in the right extreme you have coronary arteries non obstructive but high risk clot who are potential candidates for developing an acute coronary syndrome uh, do a stress tally in three groups of patients the result is going to be negative but the the way these people should be treated are totally different but you know the benefit of giving a, a secondary preventive measures will be last if you go only with the functional assessment without doing the uh, anatomical assessment so to find out which is better whether they are equal or anatomical testing will be better than uh, the functional testing two large randomized trials were conducted between 2013 and 2014 one is the promise trial in promise trial uh, 10003 patients were selected and and they uh, they were allotted to either anatomic strategy or 
functional strategy. And the primary endpoint was the outcome in 25 months. So after two years, there was no big difference in the E1 trait. That is death, MI, unstable angina, or major complications. It is 164 versus 151. Of 4,680 patients, CT angiogram, it picked up 609 patients with an abnormal coronary angiogram. And out of the 609, 439 had obstructive coronary artery disease, 170 were normal. And of the 439, nearly about 320 patients underwent revascularization. In the functional testing, 406 people were identified to have a problem and they underwent uh, the, uh, the invasive angiogram. Out of 213 were found to have normal coronaries and 193 had obstructive coronary arteries and 158 patients underwent revascularization. So, so there is a huge difference in the number of patients who underwent coronary angiogram in the CTA group compared with the functional group. And also the number of people with normal coronary or non-obstructive disease was only 170 in the CTA group and it was 213 in the functional group. And also the number of people who underwent revascularization, about 300 in the CTA group and about 150 in the functional group. But ultimately, at the end of 25 months, there is no big difference in the even rates of people who are uh, in the CTA group or in the functional assessment group. Uh, uh, probably the reason uh, probably is that 25 uh, months or two years is too short a period to assess the benefit of the treatment. Uh, concurrently, one more trial uh, was conducted that is SCADA trial and uh, the, the, the PROMISE trial. Uh, one arm is functional, the other arm is uh, CTA. Whereas in SCADA trial, all the people, nearly about 85% of the people, they underwent initially uh, 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 um, uh, exercise uh, treadmill test. Uh, the total number of people involved was about 4,146. Uh, 4, and these people were categorized into uh, uh, usual care or uh, the CTA arm. So the people, uh, two, 2,073 people were in the standard care plus coronary CTA arm, and 2,073 people were only in the standard care arm. At the end of five years, 48 patients in the coronary CTA arm had events, and it was 81%, 81 patients in the uh, standard care arm. The, there are three different groups of patients in uh, the study. One group at non-angenal pain, the second group at possible angina, and the third group had prior coronary heart disease. Out of 591 patients who had non-angenal symptom, 50% had normal coronary. Out of 1,028 with possible angina, only 33 had normal coronary. And out of 162 with prior coronary heart disease, only eight people had normal coronary. So how this finding translated into management of the patient? During the initial first year, look at the revascularization rate. Revascularization in non-anginal was very minimal. Non-anginal was very minimal, followed by more numbers in the possible anginal group and more in the uh, prior coronary heart disease group. But even here also, there is a small increase in the number of people in the CTA arm undergoing revascularization compared with the uh, standard care. And how it treated, it, it altered the treatment strategy, new preventive medications, that is aspirin and statins. In all the three groups, the number of people who received preventive therapy was much, much higher in the CTA arm than in the standard arm. So uh, probably uh, the, the physicians were, on the patients were more motivated to start starting therapy once they see a picture. Seeing is worth more than a thousand words. So whatever we try to counsel, ultimately they see the picture and if you tell them the patient has got a disease, 
and the disease can be reverted or it can be cured, they are more compliant. So this is translated, this increased compliance with the statin and aspirin treatment is translated into the benefit. So within first within the uh, one year, there is marginal benefit. And, and if you look at uh, in the five years, the number of people free from event is more in the uh, CTA arm than with the conventional arm. So even here also, in non-anginal, the people with uh, the conventional and with the CTA arm, there is a slight difference in the benefit. And the benefit increases in the second group of patients with possible angina. And in the people who have got a previous heart disease, the benefit is maximal. And the benefit starts appearing only after the first year. Uh, the curve, they remain the same during the first year in the non-anginal and possible anginal group. But it starts appearing much earlier in the previous CAD group. And that is why I said in promise group, the time given is not too long to find the benefit. Whereas if the time is given more than two years, there also you would have find out, uh, we, would, we would have uh, seen a uh, benefit with the statin group or CTA arm group. So this has uh, made uh, the UK government to change its guidelines in 2016. So when the patient presents with uh, the, uh, uh, the three typical characters of angina, the duration of the angina and relationship to exercise and dilute the rest of nitrates, if all the three characters are present, it is typical angina. If two of the three are present, it is atypical angina. And if only one is present, it is non-anginal pain. The current recommendation is, if the patient has non-anginal chest pain, and if the ECG is normal, no further testing. But if the ECG shows changes, STT changes or Q wave, do CTA. And if the patient has either typical angina or non-typical angina, they immediately need a diagnostic testing. And the diagnostic testing is preferably uh, a coronary angiogram, preferably with a 61st slice or more. And functional imaging is indicated if CTCA is non-diagnostic or diagnosis is uncertain. Compare that with the previous recommendation. So non-angenal pain, no test. If the patient has got typical or atypical angina, then you risk stratify. If the probability is less, no test. If the probability is high, invasive angiogram. In between, uh, depending on the calcium scoring, you can do either the calcium scoring, functional imaging, or invasive angiogram. So now, uh, uh, the other good thing about the CT angiogram is, so far, we are uh, talking and thinking only about the anatomy. So we thought that CTA can be only the anatomical information. And if you want to know whether this degree of stenosis is functionally important, then we may have to resort to a non-invasive functional imaging modality like uh, uh, exercise ECG or nuclear test. But now we are armed with FFR. With FFR, we can give both anatomical and functional information. How far this FFR CT is helpful in deciding which patient should undergo an invasive procedure and revascularization. To that end, the platform trial is uh, designed. So the, uh, the, uh, the stable CAD symptoms, uh, plan for non-emergent, uh, non-invasive testing, uh, age is 18 years, no prior CAD, intermediate pretest probability of CAD. One arm is uh, planned uh, non-invasive test, the other arm is uh, planned ICA. The primary endpoint is, what is the percentage of people who have non-obstructive coronary artery disease at the end of this? So if you look at the planned ICA arm, people usual care who have not undergone FFR CT, 73% of the people had non-obstructive CAD. And in the other arm, only 12% of the people had obstructive coronary artery, uh, non-obstructive coronary artery disease. And nearly 67% of the people did not undergo invasive coronary angiogram. Now, 
what did we learn from these experiences and from these trials? What we thought initially, some uh, decades ago, all the people, 100% of anatomically significant lesions should be revascularized. It is a courage trial and recently ischemic trial that told us very clearly that revascularization based on anatomical stenosis alone it does not prevent events. There is no big difference between uh, the uh, revascularization and OMT. So now what do we do? What we think now, are following the FAME trial, which demonstrated the safety of deferral of FFR negative lesion, regardless of degree of luminal stenosis. So we went on uh, to from stenosis assessment to the functional assessment. People where the FFR is negative, if it is uh, uh, more than uh, 0.8, they don't need revascularization. So the the, uh, the uh, FFR uh, less than the, uh, 0.8, they need to be revascularized. So what happens, nearly about one third of the patients whom we thought needs revascularization is taken away by FFR negative lesions. Now we think all FFR positive lesions to be revascularized. So to this, we add one more uh, dimension, and that is the a plot character. So there are certain characters of the plot which are associated with acute coronary syndrome. So these people are more prone to develop an acute coronary syndrome and they need more attention than the other group where these characters of uh, the vulnerable plot or uh, the high risk plot are not there. So approximately, this is where we, the same two trial tells us what we should think. Uh, approximately 50% of the FFR positive lesions on medical therapy alone remain even free. And there is no difference in the rate of death, MI or need for revascularization and no difference in angina. So now we have got one more group of people where the FFR is positive and high risk block is negative. This group of patients, are we safe in a differing uh, an intervention in this group of patients? So now we are left with only the uh, one third of the patient who is FFR positive, high risk block positive, need revascularization. Of course, it needs to be tested. The virtual stenting is one more uh, <clears throat> advantage of the non-invasive procedure where uh, uh, we can offline, uh, we can uh, uh, reconstruct the three-dimensional reconstruction of the coronary arteries. We can insert uh, uh, the stent and find out post stenting, what is the likely FFR? If the FFR improves beyond 0.8, maybe that is a lesion, a lesion needs to be addressed too, and stenting will benefit that patient. Plot problem. Okay. Now, the acute coronary syndrome, uh, the, uh, the idea is entirely different in acute coronary syndrome when compared with chronic coronary syndrome. Chronic coronary syndrome is a non-emergent leisurely evaluation of the chest pain. But as an acute coronary syndrome, you got to take a decision and the decision should be very fast and the decision should be accurate. So when a patient comes to you in the emergency department with the chest discomfort, unfortunately, this is the second most commonest symptom. The people come all over the world to the emergency department. And again, 80 to 85% of the patients who come to you with an acute chest discomfort, they don't seem to have any life-threatening condition. But we have to find out which patient has got a life-threatening condition and which patient do not have a life-threatening condition. So the life-threatening condition can be cardiac or non-cardiac. So non-cardiac, any organ, you know, like uh, uh, tension pneumothorax or uh, uh, rupture of the esophagus. So any of those conditions can produce uh, acute life-threatening condition. In cardiac condition, it could be a coronary or non-coronary. In non-coronary, uh, you, can, you can have an aortic dissection, you can have a pulmonary embolus, you can have a cardiac tamponade. So CT will be very useful in finding out not only uh, acute coronary syndrome, but also the other two major problems, that is dissection of the iota and pulmonary embolism. Always remember that CT angiogram is useful in ruling out. It is very, very sensitive, but the specificity is not that high. For ruling in, uh, the CT angiogram may not be very useful, but for ruling out, 
the CT angiogram is highly useful. If you find a coronary artery to be normal, then it is normal. If the coronary artery shows 50% stenosis or 80% stenosis, it may not be 80%. Always the coronary angiogram tends to overestimate the degree of stenosis. So the three groups of patients that you can make out in CT angiogram are uh, the dissection of the iota and uh, the acute coronary syndrome and pulmonary embolus. It is a Romicat study involving about 1,000 patients when people were uh, allotted either to CT angiogram or functional group or the routine evaluation of an acute coronary or an acute chest pain syndrome, more than 50% of the people were discharged from uh, the ED within 8.6 hours. And people who, were, who underwent uh, the uh, other non-invasive test, it took nearly about 27 hours to discharge the patient. And the event rate at, at end of 30 days in the CTA group and the functional group are almost the same. So the, the purpose of testing a patient with acute coronary syndrome in the emergency department is that you should not send the patient home when they have a disease and you should not make the patient wait in the department for a long time when they don't have a disease. Anywhere less than 1% discharge of a, of a patient with the disease is acceptable. And if it is more than one, then it becomes a crime. So suspected non-ST elevation MI or acute coronary syndrome. ST elevation MI, it identifies itself as ST segment elevation. They follow a different group of treatment altogether. So in suspected non-ST elevation MI, acute coronary syndrome, take an ECG. ECG may be normal. ECG may show changes. The ECG is normal, high sensitive troponin. If the troponin is negative, the, it practically rules out. High sensitive troponin, negative in one hour, practically rules out an acute coronary syndrome. Uh, it rules out uh, 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 non-ST elevation MI or myocardial necrosis. If it is positive or there is a change in the intensity, it rules in and the patient goes for and the patient goes for angiography and revascularization. And the intermediate group, again, where you are, uh, uh, you are not sure uh, whether the patient has got an acute coronary syndrome or not, then you have to do one of the two things. Either you do a functional testing or uh, CCTA. In people who have got an ongoing chest pain, even though the ECG is normal, enzymes are not elevated, and the patient has got a chest discomfort or chest pain. Though you are convinced that it is non-anginal, you want to do some test to confirm that it is not an acute coronary syndrome. So there you can do a, a resting myocardial perfusion. And if the patient has no chest pain, then you can do either a, a CT angiogram or a stress a functional testing. The, the previous uh, graph, the Romicat study has clearly demonstrated that it is accurate. A coronary angiogram is accurate in ruling out and the time to discharge from the ED department is very fast and that ends up in lesser cost to the patient. Now, we have gone through uh, the entire spectrum of uh, the CT angiogram and of all the available non-invasive tests, taking invasive angiogram as the golden standard and giving 100 marks for sensitivity and specificity, CT outscores the other non-invasive modalities of investigations in terms of sensitivity and specificity and accuracy. Again and again, I tell you, CT angiogram is for negative predictive value. It has got a 100% negative predictive value. It doesn't give you a 100% positive predictive value, though it is still in the higher range of 93 to 94%. Now stent imaging. See, the imaging of the stent by CT angiogram has always been a nightmare and is always very challenging. Maybe in the Western population where the coronary arteries are more than three millimeters in size, you may be able to visualize better than our Indian population. If the, if the stent size is more than three, we may reasonably be able to assess the uh, lumen and instant restenosis. Now uh, you can see some low attenuation, low attenuation areas here. That that means the patient has got a partial instant restenosis, and still there is a flow a distal to the stented segment. The inability or difficulty in interpreting the lumen in stenting is because of the metal. 
So the metal, uh, it has got a very, very uh, high attenuation value. It produces what is called a blooming artifact. So it is shadowing onto the lumen and it becomes very difficult. By adjusting the setup, maybe you'll be able to uh, uh, discern the lumen much better. And, and the reconstruction, what generally was being so far is filtered back projection. And what is being done is iterative reconstruction. The iterative reconstruction is a far better technology compared with filtered back projection. You can see the lumen is better seen uh, with the iterative reconstruction. Uh, this is uh, the uh, uh, LAD. LAD proximal segment shows heavy calcific block, and this is the image obtained by filtered back projection. When you do iterative uh, 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 reformation, you can see the lumen is better visualized. Still, you see a chunk of calcium around the vessel, but still the vessel lumen is at least seen. But again, it will not be anywhere close to the assessment of the stenosis by uh, invasive angiogram but better than uh, the uh, filtered back projection. And not only uh, the size of the vessel matter, but also the metal and uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, thickness also matters. So uh, this uh, is uh, the stent, taxes stent, 132 uh, um, uh, micrometers. And you can see the lumen is encroached. And see here how well the lumen is seen with Zines uh, whose uh, strut, uh, thickness is 82 micrometers. So this is uh, the uh, picture showing myocardial bridging. Uh, myocardial bridging is extremely common. It is not associated with increase in morbidity or mortality, sometimes associated with ischemia. Generally, the segment within the myocardium is not involved in atherosclerosis. It is a proximal and distal segment after the or before the uh, stent uh, bridge that produces uh, the atherosclerosis. Now the, the last part of our talk is the high risk plots. As I told you, when the atherosclerosis starts accumulating, initially there'll be an expansion of uh, the, uh, the vessel wall. Uh, once it reaches the maximal uh, expansion, what is called positive remodeling, it started encroaching onto the lumen and also uh, the necrotic material and a reparative process also happens. The inflammation and repair is denoted by the calcification. When the calcification is very dense, that means the repair is almost complete. When the calcification is spotty or very, very minimal, then the inflammation and repair is going hand in hand together. So positive remodeling, lipid or necrotic core, uh, less than 30 ounce field units and spotty calcification, it characterizes the high risk block. So this is, uh, you can see the boundary from here, it extends up to this, compare that with the normal segment. So there is a little bit dilatation of the vessel here, that is called positive remodeling. Now you have a hypodense region here, this is because of the necrotic tissue and surrounded by a little bit denser tissue. This is because of the fibrosis or fibrous tissue. And this is a yeah, much higher uh, denser lesion. This is spotty calcification. So this is uh, the observational study, which tells you about the association of the three characters of vulnerable plot and the presentation, acute coronary syndrome versus chronic coronary artery disease. So this is positive remodeling, 87%, low attenuation plot, 79%, and spotty calcium, 63%. So these three characters are associated with acute coronary syndrome, as opposed to only 12% and 9% and 21% in chronic stable angina. And in chronic stable angina, again, the high risk plots are very minimal, and the dense calcification is very high. So once you find a patient with a dense calcification and know none of the other features, you can rest assured that this uh, plot is very unlikely to develop an acute event. So the other characteristic feature of uh, uh, the high-risk plot is uh, napkin ring. So you see a low attenuation plot here, closer to the lumen and covered by 
uh, a dense uh, fibrous cap. So to conclude, CT coronary angiogram is a, a useful modality to assess coronaries in low to intermediate risk population. Additionally, FFR CT is useful in assessing the functional status of the coronary stenosis. Coronary calcium is a useful modality of reclassification of intermediate risk patients for statin therapy. Radiation of CT angiogram is comparable to invasive angiogram in present generation CT. During this now, this COVID pandemic related uh, in, this, uh, in this period, definitely CT angiogram has got a lot of advantages and CT angiogram is a viable alternative in, uh, in patients coming with the chest pain syndrome uh, where you don't know the COVID status or even uh, COVID positive patients, CT angiogram uh, can be uh, much more liberally utilized. And also you can use this technique to image the lungs simultaneously. Right? It gives an additional information. So thank you. Uh, uh, shall we move on to the spotters, if time permits? Yeah. Sure, we can go ahead, sir. OK. Oh. Can somebody spot the diagnosis? Uh, this is uh, the image showing the origin of LAD and LCX. There is no left main coronary artery. LAD and LCX arises independently. So independent origin of LAD and LCX from left sinus, absent left main coronary artery. This is left coronary sinus, this is right coronary sinus, and left main arises usually, as usual, from the left coronary sinus, but the right coronary sinus also arises independently from the left sinus. So anomalous origin of right coronary artery from left coronary sinus. Okay. Oh, this anomalous origin of circumflex from the right sinus. This is a very, very interesting spot. This is iota. And this is main pulmonary artery. What we are seeing is coronary arteries here. You don't find coronary artery coming from the iota. So the left main coronary artery arising from the pulmonary artery, alcapa. Left main arising from uh, the left sinus, albeit at a higher level, but you see a hugely dilated right coronary artery. A hugely dilated right coronary artery will only tell you that it is terminating in the low pressure chamber. The low pressure chamber maybe right atrium, right ventricle, or in any of the venous tributaries. You can see the terminal part of the right coronary artery into the coronary sinus. This is for graft evaluation. For graft evaluation, CT angiogram is one of the excellent tools. And because many times when the patient is referred to us for the evaluation of a graft, you won't know the status of the previous graph, how many graphs were given, and you know um, how many arterial graphs, how many venous graphs. None of this information you will get. You will get. You will have to go blindly, and a majority of the occasions you will have to go only through the femoral route, not through the radial route. So hooking uh, the uh, the graphs may not be very easy. Now you can see very clearly the lima free graft from the subclavian. This is an arterial graft because you see the metal artifact to LAD. And this is a venous graft to probably circumflex. And you find a nipple here. 
So that means there was a grant given to the right coronary artery which got occluded. Now, uh, this is uh, the stent study. Stent was given to proximal LAD and you find a low attenuation area over here, but the density of the distal LAD and the proximal LAD before uh, the stent, they have equal intensity. Probably, it is not a very accurate way of saying that there is no block. Probably, uh, it is not a total occlusion. So it is a partial occlusion that is shown in the cross section. You've got a low attenuation area here and the lumen is seen in the center. Okay. Generally, it is said that the collateral vessels are less than 1.5 millimeters, very difficult to make out in uh, a CT angiogram. So you can see the chronic total occlusion involved in the mid segment of uh, the right coronary artery and you see uh, the septal perforators as it is functioning as collaterals to uh, the PDA and the perforators over here. See, this is the <clears throat> main pulmonary artery, right pulmonary artery and left pulmonary artery. You can see the paucity of vessels over the left pulmonary artery. If you concentrate carefully over here, there is a pinkish area which might uh, uh, alert you of the possibility of a pulmonary embolus. Now you can see here, there is a filling defect in the left pulmonary artery, this uh, pulmonary embolus. Okay, this is a dissection of the aorta. This is the true lumen, the false lumen. It's a false lumen. This is a very interesting case. The bright object that you see here is the temporary pacemaker catheter. And you can see the shadow beyond the cardiac silhouette. It has perforated and it is lying within the pericardium. There is a small amount of pericardial effusion also. This is the ascending aorta, main pulmonary artery, descending thoracic aorta, communication between the pulmonary artery, left pulmonary artery, and the aorta. So the ductus and the coarctation. Thank you. Thank you for the patient listening. Thanks a lot, sir. Uh, it was a really an educational session, and you start from the basics to the clinical to principles, everything. Thank you very much, sir. Bobuti, uh, shall we have some questions? Yes, sir. Uh, there are a few questions. Uh, one one person has asked, uh, uh, Pritham, can you see the question? Yeah, please. I, I could not see the question. Uh, I think got, uh, since I got logged out, I came in, I could not see the question. Uh, sir, can you see the see the questions? Yeah, I could yeah, see. I can see. Yeah. yeah. So, sorry, sir. So since I logged out, uh, again, join, rejoined again, it could, I could not see it. Okay. So the first question is, can we quantify calcium score for each coronary artery? Is it validated? If calcium score is more than 400, what is the next test advised? Anatomical or functional testing? Yeah, certainly, yes. Uh, uh, the computer generates a calcium score for each individual coronary artery and also the number of blocks uh, the illustration that I have shown you, there were plots in the LAD and RCA. LAD, it had, there were a plot in three different places, and the total plot burden in the LAD was about 50 and about 20 in the right coronary artery. Definitely, yes, the report will generate calcium score for each and individual coronary arteries. Yes, it is validated. 
if the calcium score is more than 400 what is the next test advised anatomical or functional testing see basically calcium score is done only in asymptomatic patient in asymptomatic patient to find out whether they are statin eligible or not eligible to risk stratify we do the calcium score so we don't do any further test in an asymptomatic individual you cannot improve any patient who has got no symptoms at all no further test is advised in patients who are asymptomatic and if the calcium score is 400 and more than 400 and coronary angiogram is ruled out because with that heavy calcium burden if you do the coronary angiogram you cannot interpret it so no further test needed if the calcium scoring is more you will have to do you will have to give only statin and aspirin other questions sir what is the role of uh, ct angio in acute coronary syndrome it's already discussed. Say in, in, in acute coronary syndrome, if the patient is unstable and if it is risky to shift the patient to CT room, you don't do any CT angiogram. If the patient is stable, if the patient is stable in acute coronary syndrome, and if the if you are not sure whether the patient has got uh, uh, acute coronary syndrome or not, CT angiogram is indicated. As I given you in the, if, if the patient comes with chest pain, you do an ECG within 10 minutes. If the ECG shows abnormality, ST elevation goes for ST elevation, STEMI treatment. If there is an ST depression, it goes for uh, either unstable angina or N-STEMI. It is the enzyme that will tell you whether it is an N-STEMI or acute coronary syndrome. If the enzymes are elevated, then you treat it as N-STEMI. If the enzymes are not elevated, and if you have a non-diagnostic ECG, you are not sure whether it is an acute coronary syndrome or no acute coronary syndrome. So ECG being non-diagnostic, enzymes are not elevated, you are not sure whether it is an acute coronary syndrome or not. Then you have a case for either a functional testing or for anatomical testing. If the patient continues to have chest pain and you are scared to do any uh, uh, stress test, do a resting perfusion imaging. Resting perfusion image will rule out uh, an acute coronary syndrome. And if the patient do not have chest pain, then you can confidently send the patient for CT angiogram. If the CT angiogram is negative or if the coronary arteries are normal, 100%, it rules out uh, acute coronary syndrome. Or you can do functional testing also. It, it, it's left to the individual physicians, treating physicians' choice. And that is exactly what the 2020 ESC uh, recommendation is for acute coronary Sorry, you think? I think maybe we can, Salah? We can discuss it. Sada? Yes, sir. Later we can discuss it, no point. Yeah, yeah. I will wait. No, maybe we can move to the next one. Sada, can you take or invite the next speaker? Yeah, we know Dr. Zebraj is one of the senior most consultant who is familiar with uh, uh, he is very popular in cardiac MRI we have heard a learned plenty of lecture from him definitely i promise that this lecture will be beneficial for the postgraduate not only for postgraduates for all the consultants who is practicing day to day welcome dr jebraj Thank you. 
Yes, sir, we can hear you, sir. Sir, you are not audible now. Hello. You are audible, sir. <laughs> just now, my electricity went off in our house, so I'm just connected through the mobile and the mobile hotspot. I just. Dreading this. Hello. Yes, sir. You are here. Can I just leave and then re uh, rejoin? Sure, sir. Okay. Uh, I'll leave and rejoin. Sure, sure, sir. Meanwhile, uh, Dr. Sadanandam, you, you you are about to ask a question to the, Dr. Krishnamurti, sir. Would you like to ask it now? Yes, sir. Uh, no, just I want to know the, 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 the we discussed in the last uh, seminar, last lecture. Um, do you have any images of uh, coronary stent infection and uh, dilatation of coronary related tool? No. Coronary stent infection. No, no, no. Okay, I should not ask all this extempo question, but I thought in, if, if you no, have any. I have pictures of uh, practice stent, <laughs> all those things I have. But uh, no stent infection and aneurysmal dilatation. No. Oh, thank you. Sir, I have one doubt. Do you have? Do you think uh, there is a benefit of getting three twenty or six forty CT scan when when we have one twenty eight CT scan except for the patient comfort of holding the breath? For 10 seconds in 128 and 3 in 320 and 1 second in 640. Is there any any better uh, temporal and spatial resolution, any better pictures that we can get with the higher end uh, CAT scan machine as compared to a 128 CAT scan machine? No, I don't see that. So as a matter of fact, the 64 slice that was coming uh, uh, 10 years ago that produced a, a magical picture. You could have seen all these potters. That quality picture you will never get now because of the radiation fear. Now, what we used to give is about uh, 400 milliamperes and 120 kV. Now, majority of the machines, they give an output of 100 kV and uh, the, um, uh, this is about 350 to 400 milliamperes. So with that low radiation, taking the patient's safety into consideration, the quality of the image certainly suffers. The image quality will not be anywhere closer to with the 64 slice CT. 128 slice is okay, more than adequate. For that matter, even 64 slice with uh, dual uh, uh, source uh, Siemens, that is also equally good. I don't find any big difference in the quality or any other uh, thing between 128 and uh, 320. How do you color code the plaque, sir? You, you are showing some pink, green, and uh, white color, uh, yellow color. Yeah, that is software given by GE. Okay. It's only G specific. Yeah, only G. Uh, G. Now, everything, you know, uh, the computer, uh, the, the CT. Uh, uh, there's a paper published in Jack Imaging where they found direct correlation of MACE events in future, but I think subgroup of MESA, uh, where they found the total plug burden in pan arterial segment goes with future, not uh, hypnosis, the plug burden itself goes with future MACE Correct. as expected. So if you are yes. able to identify total block burden, will you be able to quantify the total block burden if you get a CT scan? Uh, if you have the source image, if you have the source image, maybe yes. Otherwise, uh, with the uh, still pictures, no. 
no what that's what i'm telling you. if I, if i get a ct scan today can i get my total plaque burden in the coronaries yeah, all coronary plaque burden in the entire coronaries certainly yes certainly yes the 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 uh, ct scoring is part and parcel of the evaluation of a coronary angiogram with all the machines all the machines have that software and they give the total calcium burden calcium burden in individual coronary arteries and also the percentile the upgrade for value evaluation also sir do they give upgradation or upgrade for ct for calculation ct for sir i am asking you ct for calculation of flow reserve so sorry your uh, uh, question was not clear so i am asking for ct fractional flow reserve assessment should uh, is the software software for the trading or it is a separate package no ct ffr at site as of now is not available here if you send the images to the company he will evaluate and give you the ffr ct ffr ct is not done at the center Thank you. Thank you. Sir, uh, being an imaging specialist, in your practice, if a crop, if you encounter a patient with chronic stable angina, if uh, what exactly is your approach? Uh, you you get the CAT scan done, or you will uh, go for a, a regular treadmill or myocardial perfusion imaging in your practice? now the, the practice i had been doing now during the pandemic is i asked for more often it's now pre pandemic sir pre pandemic in this just okay jabara sir is angiogram okay okay dr jabara has, sir has already joined with us sir over to dr jabara sir thank you sir it was a great presentation i learned a lot personally i learned a lot a lot of uh, uh, ct has been uh, it's a very wonderful refresh uh, refreshing uh, uh, lecture for us thank you thank you jabra sir yes. there is one question from the uh, 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 audience uh, regarding uh, in chronic stable angina what is the modality of investigation whether you go for ct coronary angiography versus functional imaging or vice versa sir has discussed its own, one's own uh, preference according to the nice guidelines which has been updated way back in 2016 and they are, if you look at the history nice actually uh, predates almost every uh, guidelines even starting from uh, removing beta blocker from hypertension to a majority of the major changes because it's a nhs run uh, institute in this run foundation so they give a lot of importance to cost effectiveness so irrespective of the, the unless the patient has got acute coronary syndrome the current approach is to go for a C ct coronary angiography in nice i presume that the entire world will follow it in a, in a couple of years or so uh, and also there's a huge lacuna in amongst cardiologists including uh, most of our cardiologists uh who have got the inhibition in learning or uh, they are reluctant to learning ct angiography i personally feel once the cardiologists are going to uh, enter into the field of cardiac imaging especially ct coronary angiography the real threshold of the ct coronary angiography will be utilized and most of the uh, appropriate indication uh, most of the cath invasive catheterization will be done only for appropriate patients and we will not miss any any patient who actually require invasive cath if you go for a ct coronary angiography that will only happen if cardiologists as a cardiologist we take the tool and proceed with the evaluating the ct coronary angiography instead of what is being practiced here predominantly done by radiologist what is your opinion about it sir right the the uk uh, the nice guidelines it gives more weightage for ct coronary angiogram the american heart association it gives more weightage for functional assessment 
but you know the ct angiogram and the functional assessment it gives totally two different types of information ct angiogram is basically for rule out functional assessment is basically for rule in and if in a given situation yes. if the probability is very low you want to rule out ct angiogram is the preferred mode of examination in the same intermediate group if the probability is more if you want to rule in then functional assessment will be better still better will be a sequential where you get you want to get both the anatomical and physiological but for screening this is the rule if the probability is very low you want to rule out ct angiogram if the probability is more you want to rule in functional assessment is better uh so dr debra is there uh, uh so you can connect now I'm not able to see the share screen. Ah. Yeah. Um. Okay. Yeah, sure. Man, again, what's the end? Super. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, can you see the presentation? Yeah, yes, sir. Your presentation is clear. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. I thank uh, Professor Murli sir and the rest of the team for letting me um, uh, present something on cardiac MRI. I am really in love with this technology. For the past ten to twelve years, I've been practicing this, and it is it is really exciting to. Uh, do almost every scan, and uh, my aim on this was to show uh, so the topic is very vast. So I thought I would just show a few examples where cardiac MRI can help in our clinical management. And uh, still, cardiac MRI has not penetrated too much into the um, uh, into every part of India and part of the world. Um, but if we could use this technology it helps us a lot in making uh, clinical decisions uh, now uh, when we look at cardiac mri this uh, this is the patient who is inside the gantry and there is a big magnet and a lot of things go go on within the gantry what exactly happens is that the body is full of water and each water molecule has two hydrogen atoms and uh, they can be considered for our mri purposes as they have a proton and the proton will be uh, doing something called precision inside the body and when we put this body into a magnetic field they all align themselves and uh, we use radio frequency waves 
to change this alignment and when the when the alignment comes back take the signal and produce an image like this it is all all the um, signals are put into a space imaginary space called k space and the finally image is uh, reconstructed like this now mr imaging there are a lot of um, uh, misunderstandings about mri what all does it involve it involves body's own hydrogen atoms within the water molecule then it involves a large magnet and that is what we see as 1.5 tesla or 3 tesla or whatever and very many smaller dynamic magnets which come on and off as the scan is going on and these are the ones which create all that noise also it involves radio frequency waves the mr imaging does not involve any ionizing radiation we are always surrounded with radio frequency waves and in cardiac in any mr imaging we use certain frequency radio waves then we can, we also may need to use contrast most of the images cine images that we see in cardiac mri do not involve any injection of contrast the body's own protons blood's own protons give the contrast but we may have to give gadolinium as a contrast and this contrast is not nephrotoxic but when there is renal failure there is a certain risk of nephrogenic fibrosis and that risk varies among the different salts of gadolinium some of the salts are not associated or very infrequently associated some of the salts are more frequently associated then the noise mostly it comes from the gradient coils as electricity high voltage electricity is passed in and out of those coils to produce this temporary magnets then the patient has to lie down maybe claustrophobic patient scanner inside the scanner gantry for up to 90 minutes which is a problem and we need special magnet safe equipment for resuscitation if events occur also for maybe injecting contrast or pulse oximeter all of them now in our cardiac imaging repetitor there are different modalities which are used and cardiac mr should be one of the major modalities that that should be used now in cardiac mr there are very many different sequences and they are all still being evolved and among this family of different sequences we can select pick and choose what would be useful for certain patient and also since we have very many different kinds of sequences and they are all acquired by different ways we have something called internal validity which also comes along with mr imaging now so it is called a robust investigation a robust investigation according to wikipedia should be with a wide range of capabilities a system does not break down easily and is not wholly controlled by a single application failure and it should not be affected by a bug in one aspect a system that either recovers quickly or holds up to um, uh, whatever now what are the primary indications of cmr one of my um, fellowship colleagues fellows in great ormond street when i was doing fellowship had written the statement of course in the journal of cardiovascular magnetic imaging in the pediatric population or congenital heart disease population cmr could be indicated for any patient in whom clinical or echocardiographic data is insufficient for monitoring or decision making or surgical planning in the adult world cm especially in the ep and uh, other uh, ischemic world cmr finds routine application in cases where cardiac function in conjunction with detailed tissue characterization is necessary for decision making and treatment evaluation so it can give you information on myocardial inflammation ischemic heart disease and heart failure 
Now, what are the strengths of cardiac MRI? One first would be the ventricular volume estimation, not only ventricular, or even atrial volume and function of the ventricle. It is considered to be the gold standard now. Accurate measurement of flows, which helps us, it is, flows are acquired in a different way. So it helps us to counter check our volume data. Tissue characterization, which is very important. With all with minimal inter and intra observer variation. There are no window issues because it is a three dimensional modality. Non-invasive, multi-planar because three dimensional. There is no ionizing radiation. So serial exams can be done. And the only problem would be the contrast. So we need not use contrast in, in every examination. And the contrast has less side effects compared to many other contrasts. And as I said before, it is multimodal with internal validation. Now, famously, we want to say cardiac MRI can look at these four Fs, the form of the heart, morphology, function of the heart, flow, blood flow through the different vessels and through the valves, and fibrosis, in short for tissue characterization. It's not just fibrosis, but all the different aspects of cat tracing. You could do something like a non-invasive biopsy. We'll go through each of those four Fs. When we look at form, I will give you one example. This is a 34-year-old man who, was, who brought his parents from Calcutta for a neurology consultation. He had free time because for two days he was sitting in the hospital for his parents' consultation. He thought he would do a whole body checkup. And he chose echocardiogram as one of the options. And during echocardiogram, it was actually difficult echo windows. What we could discern was situs inverses with probable LTGA. More details could not be obtained, so we decided to do a cardiac MRI. I hope this video would play. This was a case report in Jack. We could clearly see all the anatomy. This is situs inverses, the iota is on the right side of the spine, the atrium, the right atrium is on the left side, left atrium is on the right side, ventricles are also inverted, so the left-sided ventricle actually is the morphological left ventricle, subpulmonary, and um, we can see all the features. In addition to that, what we could not discern on echo was this membrane within the left atrium. And uh, this is a cross-sectional imaging of the membrane. And this is a flow image, which took up, which was done at this plane, perpendicular to this, perpendicular to this, and we see this flow estimation. So this was situs inverses with mesocardia, anatomically corrected transposition of the great arteries with systemic dysfunctional right ventricle mild tricuspid regurgitation with cortreatrium sinister. And this patient was very asymptomatic, not much tricuspid regurgitation, possibly because of some amount of pulmonary hypertension due to the cortreatrium and a restrictive flow through the cortreatrium opening. Everything could be discerned from this one examination. If you look at function, if we have a normally functioning ventricle, any modality will give us an accurate measurement of the ventricular systolic function, especially. And so this is a patient who has normally functioning ventricle, and we could get the end systolic, diastolic volume, end systolic volume in any different modality. Suppose if you have a patient like this, who has an inferior infraceptal or uh, uh, aneurysm and there is an infarct, it is very difficult to get a function. M mode, if we, where, where we cut the ventricle, will give a different uh, value. And M mode 
is a calculated value, a mode function is a calculated value, and it's not an observed value because it takes into consideration the left ventricle is of pyramidal shape and the not a flattened ventricle like the right ventricle. There is uniform wall movement, there is no valvular regurgitation, and there is no conduction abnormality causing regional movement variation, and there is no intramural filling defect. Simpson's method, apex is foreshortened, endocardial dropouts are seen, and relies on only two planes. If we take, this is an example of the same patient, if we do a function M mode at this level, and this level would be totally different. If you take cardiac MRI, this is what is done. We take a four chamber view and then cut this four chamber view at about five millimeter thick slices, which gives us slices like this, which gives us slices like this. And each at each of the slice, the endocardium and the epicardial borders in diastole and systole are traced and the volumes of each of the slices are calculated. Finally, they are all added. If there is an intramural filling defect or regional wall motion abnormality, all of them could be accounted for when we do a functional analysis like this. So even if you have a ventricular movement like this, septal movement or aneurysm, we could get accurate ejection fraction, accurate volumes, which could help us to manage this patient appropriately. I will give you another example. This is a person who's had an antiseptal infarct and had come to the hospital for next treatment. When we look at the four chamber view, it looks like elevated infarct and not moving at all. And maybe some anterior bulge. And when you look at the outflow tract, there is absolutely no abnormality here. But if we do the VLA view, when we look at two chamber view, we could see this huge aneurysm anteriorly. And this would help us to prognosticate. Also, we could look at, suppose we want to do an aneurysectomy. If you want to cut off the ventricle, we could see where we should cut off the ventricle, the extra aneurysm. And also we could estimate the volume after we have uh, done an aneurysectomy. The other place where function is very um, easily done by, MR, appropriately done by MRA is to look at right ventricular function. The right ventricle, as we know, wraps around the left ventricle. Echo windows are often suboptimal as it is just under the chest wall and also lung many times overlaps the right ventricle. There is no appropriate mathematical formula to calculate. So MR would be the best modality for estimating the right ventricle. So this is a patient who has corrected transposition and biventricular dysfunction, especially the right subsystemic ventricular dysfunction. We could evaluate all the different aspects of this patient's heart by cardiac MRI. What about flow? So I'll give you one example. This is a patient, a boy, 12 year old boy, who had a small ASD and both parents are doctor parents, had been on follow-up from one year of age. Every year when we do the echo, we finally say, we will see next year. We don't know what will happen to this ASD. We might have to close the ASD. So they wanted a definite answer. So cardiac MRI was done flow estimation was done. We could measure accurately all the different flows. This is the aortic flow. This is the MPA flow. This is the right pulmonary artery flow and the left pulmonary artery flow. All of them can be charted and we could accurately get the QPQS. Once we know the QPQS, we could tell them what to do. We could also estimate the ASD in the appropriate plane and we could estimate the flow across the ASD many times. And if it correlates with the rest of the estimation, then we are confident that the numbers are accurate and we could decide what to do. We could also look at the additional problems like PAPVC or the rims and all that. 
So combined observations of flow and um, volumes could give a, could validate our our data. We could also get aortic pulmonary regurgitant fractions, RV stroke volume, MPF. If you subtract RV uh, MPF flow from RV stroke volume, we could get tricuspid regurgitation, and so on, mitral regurgitation. If we combine the pressure data from cardiac cath, we could accurately measure PVRA and SVRA. What about tissue characterization? We could characterize myocardial edema, looking for myocarditis or in acute myocardial infarction, fat infiltration into the myocardium, though that is less and less important now, fibrosis of myocardium, infiltration with amyloid, sarcoid, also tumor characterization, trying to see what is the tissue of the tumor made of. So in, just to give an example, this is a patient who came with a VT and cardiac MR imaging showed epicardial. This first is the edema image. We see this extra water on the epicardial surface, sub-epicardial surface of the left ventricle. And at the same place, there is delayed enhancement. And this patient had ablation by going epicardially. So we could find out where the delayed enhancement or where the fibrosis, where the edema is, and appropriately the therapy could be guided. These are the different patterns of post gadolinium enhancement. And depending on what pattern the gadolinium enhancement is, it gives us an idea about what the problem is non-invasively. We could also, we have examples of, suppose we want to have a tissue diagnosis, we could direct the tissue biopsy to the location where there is abnormality. About fat, we have, since we have different sequences, in some of the sequences we can make fat appear and some of the sequences we can make the fat disappear. So this is a sequence where the fat is clearly seen, epicardial fat, chest wall fat, and this areas of fat within the left ventricle and the right ventricular uh, free wall. And we could subtract the fat in the next sequence to see they are really fat and nothing, nothing else. So the same patient had the CINE exams. We can see clearly the right ventricular outflow tract outpoaching aneurysm formation. This is a accordion movement of the free wall, right ventricular free wall and delayed enhancement shows these are fat, and some of these areas could be fat, or um, if we compare these areas with the fat subtracted image, we could see whether they're fibrosis or fat. So this patient had an RV endostyle volume of 120 ml per meter square with regional wall movement, which gives us a major criteria for ARVC, ARVD. In dilated cardiomyopathy, we could look for function, plus we could also look for delayed enhancement. This gives us a prognostic, we can prognosticate from this information. When there is a lot of delayed enhancement within the myocardium, we do not expect this patient to improve significantly over the coming months and years. So we could help them to understand this is a problem which might go on for a long term and might need heart transplant, LV um, supportive device, etc. About amyloidosis, amyloidosis, this is a patient with hypertrophy of the ventricular muscle, mildly decreased systolic function. And this image of delayed enhancement clearly shows extensive subendocardial delayed enhancement, not respecting any coronary artery territory, which is characteristic of amyloidosis. And we could arrive at this without doing any tissue biopsy. If need be, we could direct wherever there is delayed enhancement uh, biopsy. What about sarcoidosis? We could look for edema. The top panel is edema imaging. Clearly, there are areas of edema. 
and delayed enhancement, which shows there is fibrosis, mid-myocardial fibrosis. And uh, when there is edema, we could think that it is acute process going on. And, uh, or we could also discern whether it is a burnt out sarcoidosis. What about its use in ischemic heart disease? There are different ways we can look at ischemic heart disease. We can look at CINE MRI, where we can discern whether any regional wall movement abnormality is there, what is the function. And this can be combined with stress imaging. It can be both vasodilator stress or um, um, contractile stress with dobutamine. We can also do a T2 imaging, which shows us increased water content or myocardial edema, which would tell us about the infarct age or age area at risk. We could do perfusion with rest and stress and see the difference and look for any um, coronary artery significant obstruction and delayed enhancement imaging, looking for myocardial necrosis, infarct size, viability, plus if it is a microvascular obstruction. This is a picture how this delayed enhancement images are done. The basic idea is that in delayed enhancement imaging, we are looking for gadolinium sitting within the myocardium. So you give gadolinium first, and if there is fibrosis, the extra vascular space is increased, extra cellular space, sorry, is increased, and the gadolinium goes and sits within this extra cellular space. When you compare uh, myocardium to collagen tissue, collagen has a lot of extra cellular space. So gadolinium goes and sits there. And if there is not much um, perfusion, that gadolinium does not get washed off. So it stays within it. So if we look for gadolinium after about 10 minutes, and if you find gadolinium, that will probably is fibrous tissue. And this is very well validated by, um, by a lot of experimental studies, including um, an animal studies where you cause myocardial infarction and then uh, do this imaging and you do sacrifice the animal and do a tissue biopsy and everything cor correlates well. So this is a very well proven technique looking for fibrosis of any tissue. This is an example of um, first pass perfusion. Here we can clearly see there is no perfusion of the apex. And this is the delayed enhancement images where we see this delayed enhancement and probably there is a, um, an area of uh, intramural thrombus. We can look at the extent or the thickness of the myocardial scar. So if you see the left-sided panel, there is a LAD territory infarct and an RCA territory infarct. The LAD territory, this is the uh, corresponding short axis slice and hypokinetic anterior wall, almost akinetic inferior wall. And inferior wall scar thickness will be probably around more than 50% the LED territory scar probably less than 50%. So we could say the LED area is viable, RCA area is not viable. This is another, on the left side panel, there is another example where there is an extensive RCA and LCX infarct, LCX territory, RCA territory, including RV infarct. And all these areas are probably not viable it is not worth pursuing this area for reperfusion. And this data can, can be put into a 17 segment um, uh, bullseye chart, looking for both segmental function, scarring and perfusion. And depending on it, we can decide on what to do further. So when to add CMR to our armamentarium? There are three situations where we would want a CMR. When both echo and other tests are equally reliable. If echo and other tests have poor echo window or an uncooperative patient who does not want to have a QOE, I have an example of a person for 10 years, he did not want to do an echo 
transesophageal echo to rule out a sinus venosus AST. Finally, we detected sinus venosus AST by cardiac MRI and underwent correction. When echo and other tests are borderline or ambiguous, when you need, need an additional test, for example, for LV data, for valve regurgitant fractions, or for tumor or pericardial evaluation for constrictive pericarditis or trying to rule out a restrictive phenomena, or in situations where CMR is clearly superior and provides more reliable data, for example, looking at the right side of the heart, morphology, global regional function, even on the left side, tissue characterization, looking for edema, scar, or fat or iron infiltration. Now there are exciting techniques which are coming up. This is an XMR suite where we have um, the cath lab and the MRI suite adjacent to each other. The patient's couch goes from the cath lab to the MR. So this is very useful trying to calculate PVRA and SVRA. Initially, the patient goes to the MR and gets the anatomy evaluated, the flow evaluated. Then the patient is wheeled onto the uh, cath, get all the pressure data taken, and with vasodilator or pulmonary vasodilator, those things are done. Again, the patient is shifted back to estimate flow with vasod pulmonary vasodilator, and those data are uh, put into and cal to calculate PVR and SVRA. This is another exciting field where 4D flow mapping is coming up where we could really see, we can tag each of these voxels or spots of blood and see where bloods go. We could even tag blood coming from the right upper pulmonary vein and see where that blood goes through the heart and we can detect PAPVC. We can also detect the reason for, this is a patient with coarctation repaired plus bicuspidatic valve and the blood flow goes through like this with a swirling pattern causing this ascending iota dilatation. And uh, this can be used, even now computerized data can be used to modify our surgical procedure to have optimum result. This is another picture where we can see which part of the left ventricle does not empty. So looking at the different, we can tag each voxel of blood. Voxel means a volume, small square um, cube shaped uh, volume. And um, we can tag each of those voxels with different characters. And we could see where blood does not move, what blood comes and where it goes. For lack of time, I'm not explaining this whole thing. What are the contraindications? non-MR compatible pacemaker and ICD. Not only this, even if MR compatible, sometimes the, the pacemaker and the ICD comes in front of the heart. So imaging may be difficult. So some other mode of imaging probably is more uh, uh, informative. Magnetic foreign bodies in critical soft tissue, especially within the brain, if you have aneurysm clips, or foreign bodies within the brain or eye, which are magnetic, and claustrophobic patient. Having said that, many times in my last maybe 100, 1,500 or 1,800 scans, maybe three to four patients we were not able to scan in India. So most of the time, we will be able to overcome the claustrophobia with some anxiolytics and oral assurance. So to summarize, Cardiac MRA is a versatile mode of evaluation. It has a bouquet of tools to evaluate the different aspects of the cardiac morphology and function. If one of them fail, the other would take over. It is a robust modality with many inbuilt validation tools as there are many different sequences evaluating different aspects of the heart structure and function. It is still evolving. It is only about 20 years old and new techniques are being developed all the time. So it is a te technology to be in, and it's fairly safe without any major side effects. Thank you.
Да-да. Elaborate lecture. Definitely anything we have learned from this lecture. Thank Can you. Have... Okay. Thank you for the detailed lecture, sir. Can we go for any kind of clarification? There are two questions. Yes. One, one is the first one is the what is the role of COVID and uh, cardiac cardiac MRI in COVID myocarditis? Huh. At the present time, I think the, the, there are uh, reports of myocarditis, and uh, probably if you combine perfusion with because many times COVID myocarditis presents like uh, coronary event. So probably we can rule out. I have not done. I don't know. Uh, others. Hello. Sir, another question from uh, audience. Yeah. Uh, which the CT or MRI for assessment of collaterals in the coarctation of aorta. Okay. Um, if you um, looking at collaterals, um, do we really need to know where the small collaterals are? If you want to look at any small collateral, CT would be the best modality. If we, um, but CT involves its uh, problems. I would go for uh, an MRI because I can look at see flow assessment I can do. Um, almost if you see the first picture that was actually we can we, it was a coarctation picture where generally most of the major vessels collaterals can be obtained, can be seen. And since it's a, it's a moving image, we will also have an idea of probably where, what would be the dimension of the lumen. And uh, suppose if you're thinking of a stent placement, balloon dilatation, what should be the length of the dynamically. Where a CT will give us much better resolution image, but static image. So, there are uh, instances where people have taken uh, MR images and then looked at, put the stent there and see with movement of the um, iota during cardiac uh, action, what will happen to the stent? What will, will it move this way, that way? What will happen? One more question. Uh, yeah. When can one person can go for MRI after a device or stent procedure? Nowadays, there's hardly any um, any contraindication after a device. Stents, ASD, I've done uh, MRI after the, the next day, uh, post, uh, the post ASD closure. So all this, um, almost every material that we use, prosthetic material that we use, are non-ferromagnetic. Um, so they can safely go through MR investigation without any major problem. There is a very good website called mrsafety.com, which classifies all the almost all the cardiac devices and non-cardiac devices are there and what is its safety uh, profile with MR, especially 1.5 or 3 Tesla strength MR. So most, almost every device stent they can go through. Sometimes you will have artifacts because of the device or stent. And it is found that the movement of the of the of the weakly, very weakly ferromagnetic material is much less than what it goes through during the regular cardiac activity. So generally there are no major contraindications because of the devices or stents. Even the heating also the same. There's minimal heating, about 0.5 centigrade, degree centigrade or something. Uh, 
the next question is uh, they have asked what are the preferred indications for 4d flow mapping versus conventional cardiac mri 4d flow mapping is still not a part of regular flow of work because it is not available in most machines it involves a little longer time and also it involves the latest uh, techniques which most machines do not have only the new machines with every uh, available program available will have it so 4d mapping it gives us um, something like as i showed in the picture the the blood swirling within within the vessel or what is happening to um, the flow not the real velocity but what is happening to the different uh, boxes of blood so it will be useful if you are maybe thinking of aortic valve repair or something where the ascending aortic dilatation you want to prevent and that kind of thing also uh, another place where 4d mapping might uh, be useful will be um in fontan circulation if you're creating fontan circulation what will happen to ivc blood what will happen to the svc blood how can you distribute ivc blood to both the lungs uh, equally that it is still not it is still in experimental use over the past 10 years it's been exp in experimental use so that means there is there are some major hurdles in the hardware aspect Yeah, in BCMP, where is where there is veteran VT, is it possible to locate the site of origin of uh, VT to? It will be helpful for ablation. Definitely, we can look for edema. So edema probably, if there is myocarditis or if there is uh, an area, we can look for edema in an acute process. So in in an acute condition, we can look for edema and we can direct our um, uh, ablation. to that is subepicardial endocardial mid myocardial sometimes we may not be able to reach so maybe our um, ablation might fail um in chronic condition um we can definitely look at usually especially in uh, ischemic the area around the scar which is partly perfused are usually the areas which start to have arrhythmia so we may be able to direct the ep uh, ablation towards it we can give an idea about it in dcm as i said there are uh, two if you have a lot of delayed enhancement we think probably this patient will not recover and will continue to worsen significantly so we can prepare the patient for further therapies Actually, what is the hindrance in assessing the small vessels, sir? Actually, in MR, because the previous question actually we deviated from the question. He mm has -hmm. asked about uh, uh, collaterals in uh, um, coagulation of aorta, map cause in congenital heart disease, cyanotic heart disease. So this is pertaining to. I am also concerned about uh, physiological assessment of coronary stenosis. What is stopping MR from going There forward are, in? No, because the the um as uh, uh, sir said the resolution is less than what is at, what is available by ct or coronary regular coronary angio so when you have a less resolution image looking at that very reliably is not very good having said that actually one advantage will be you do not see calcium in mr imaging so it is an advantage because you subtract calcium so the artifact of calcium goes away from your assessment and uh, um, the proximal coronary arteries even now can be very reliably assessed 2 mm 3 mm structure can be reliably assessed with mr non contrast images but when you go from proximal from mid to distal it is still not clinically a uh, reliable test 
but uh, even 1 ml flow people have assessed 1 ml of flow or 2 ml of flow per heartbeat and uh, it, it is a thing which is coming up because the resolution is less Uh, thank you, Dr. Krishna Murthy, sir. Thank you, Dr. Jabra, sir. It was a wonderful evening. Uh, you spent almost two hours and thirty minutes in uh, uh, in educating us, uh, educating all the postgraduates who are who are exam going at present, uh, so that they have got some idea about uh, con some basement basement uh, ideas about uh, CT of uh, heart and MR of heart. We have we actually had a series of lectures by Dr. Jabra, sir, in our department. Um, it's very difficult to uh, con uh, talk about a CT scan and MRI in one session. They have done say they have done their best. They have um, uh, did a wonderful session. Uh, thank you all. Have a great evening. Uh, see you on next session where we will be discussing about tower and mitral from postgraduate point of view. What what all the things that a postgraduate should be uh, knowing in in case they are going to be asked uh, in exams. uh that that will be they will be able to uh, clear their doubts also